welcome to Field Sports Britain, coming to you this week from Scotland. This is the estuary of the River Nith in Dumfriesshire. Coming up, we're out with Solway stalker Colin Lockerbie, just here. We're finding out why everybody comes to Fife. It's the pigeons and roebuck, of course. Fox shooting blunders. How can you improve your lamping technique? First, it's our popular new series, Test Splat Special. For this week's Test Splat Special, we are mainly shooting a piece of frostbitten pork. We don't like wasting food, but this test should give us an idea about the performance of a 243 100 grain soft point bullet from 120 ish yards on a decent chunk of meat. So what are the possibilities for porcine aviation today? How far will a pig fly? Will it be A, 3 metres, B, 7 metres, C, far and wide? The first shot is taken using 240 frames per second and if you look closely you can see the bullet coming in from the right of frame. It splits the pork but leaves it in situ so a chance of another go. Again, the bullet is visible on the image recorded at 480 frames per second. Finally, a third shot and we're aiming for the bone to provide some resistance. This image is taken at 1000 frames per second and the pig has wings. So let's get the tape out. And we're going to have to get a bigger tape measure. The pork has been sent well over 15 metres away from the target position, so anyone who chose C far and wide earns the approbation of the masses. Please don't have nightmares, nothing proved, nothing gained, just for fun next week a kettle and firebird with an air rifle. We've got other test splats, like this egg that's just appearing in the sky beside me. Click on it and you can see more of them. Now, on to the serious stuff. We're out with Zeiss professional stalker Colin Lockerbie. It's early in the morning in the village of New Abbey, just south of Dumfries. Solway stalker Colin Lockerbie has a client, Gary, who wants a Roebuck. Uh, Roebuck's today, Charlie. We've got to have a look over a wee clear fell. It's, um... It's been cut recently and got to be replanted later this year, so we'll, we'll see how we can do that. I spotted a couple of roebucks there recently, so hopefully they'll be about. Colin offers deer and wild boar stalking across 20,000 acres of southern Scotland. He is one of the most respected stalkers in Scotland and a Zeiss professional hunter to boot. We check out Clearfeld plantations and we go for a walk along the beach. The estuary of the River Nith is big, flat and its creeks provide food for deer in the early morning. As we walk along, we put one up. Were we making too much noise? Was the animal lucky? It sure was. I just heard the movement on the, the bank there and uh, I saw a run off about five or ten seconds later. It was a doe just run off into the force road. We enter a small bluebell wood and there is a buck. But there is no way Gary is going to risk firing around through this kind of thick cover. I tried to put the crosshair just onto his neck, but just couldn't take the shot. Bullet it goes through that brush, it would just deflect off. And more chance of doing a bit of damage to him rather than dropping the plane, so that is what we As the day warms up, so do the arguments about whether or not we were making too much noise. Colin's boots have been making a squelching, squeaking sound. My cheap Dunlops have been badly clumpy, and Gary's boots look far too shabby to be silent. Well, one of the issues about this morning's stalk was the squeak in our boots, and we've been complaining to each other about that, so we thought we'd do a little test. I'll take the Field Sports Channel microphone here, and I'll attach it to each of our boots, and you can tell which one you think is the squeakiest. In the end, I am disqualified for tiptoeing. Colin bows out because his boots are wet on the inside, so Gary is declared Mr. Cat Like Tread 2012. He admits that part of the reason his boots are so supple and silent is that they are made of kangaroo skin. Now, Colin is not just a deer stalker. He has a small but growing population of wild or feral boar in his area. Uh, this is wild boar being written, written about here. Um, that was in October last year. October? That's, I mean, that's eight months ago. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's still torn up? Yeah, uh, it's difficult land for the farmer to repair, so uh, it'll probably have to stay like that. Now you do wild boar shooting here, don't you? Yeah, yeah. But you also feed them? Yeah, I feed them to the high seats, yeah. So you're trying to contain them in one area? What's, what's the, how does that work? Yeah, just try to keep the farmers happy, really. Um, you know, we draw them to an area just over here, maybe have a site, high seat set up over there. Um, I haven't actually shot any on this area here, so I would expect to see them back again, uh, probably same time next year after they've eaten acorns again. So they eat acorns and come and root up fields? Come and root up the fields for a bit of meat uh, in their diet as well, after they've eaten a lot of acorns, yeah. Typical drunk Scotsman then? Yeah, yeah. One in three of Collins' boar outings succeeded last year. Boar shot ranged from 30 kilograms to these monsters of 140 kilograms. Just put the seat up here a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, feds, the pigs have found the food pretty quickly. Um, they're feeding sort of, well they're here every night. I put food out just uh, two nights, every second night just now. And when are you going to shoot them? Uh, won't shoot here now until October. Um, there's a big sow feeding here with youngsters now, so I'll leave them alone for the summer. There's not much about Solway fish and game that Colin doesn't know or cannot provide. The Nith nearly scored Britain's biggest rod caught salmon when a monster weighing around £100 fought and beat a bishop in the 19th century. It was later caught in nets with the bishop's fly still in its mouth. Colin cannot boast a fish that big in his lifetime, but he is a master of the old Viking practice of half netting. How do you know you've got a fish? Well, when the water's racing through the, the, the net here, you hold the, the net in your thumb, the net's quite tight here, and you just feel the, the tug on your, your finger, and then you lift, and the fish will be back in the net here. Now, how do you get it out of that? Yeah, it's, it's again very simple. You catch the net and throw it over into the Net. So it's double netted then, hanging over here, and we carry a priest in our bag just to kill the fish, throw it back over and uh, lift it out. Very, very easy once you've done one or two. Now is this, is this what you call commercial netting? No, it's, it's more or less just a hobby now. Um, there's not the number of fish there used to be a few years back, um, so it's, it's really just a hobby. And you're not going to take me out now because they're not running at the moment? They're not running, it's too cold in the water to, to stay there very long just now anyway. There are other ways to catch fish around here. Colin takes us to see Peter Hutchison, who has bigger nets on the Solway. These are our salmon steak nets, they call them fixed engine fishery nets. They're an old style of fishing along the Solway coast here for salmon, but they've been on the go here in the Solway for well over 200 years. There are not many left now, a lot of the fisheries are gone, but uh, uh, we still enjoy these ones here. And you, and you catch all sorts in here as well as salmon, don't you? We get a range of fish that go from top. Yeah. Top are typically our largest fish. Uh, right down through to shad, which are of the herring family. Uh, they are currently taking into uh, research projects. Solway wide at the moment, so we give them to Galloway Fishery Trust. Uh, but salmon, sea trout, that's the main issue for us. Uh, we get some lovely turbot now and again, and a few other things. So. Uh, yeah, the variety is always fun. Now the day is growing cool once again and Colin and Gary still have an appointment with a buck. Colin takes us to a new plantation which has been suffering road damage recently. All thoughts of the long walks and missed opportunities from earlier in the day fly away because there is Gary's animal. They want these animals culled on this particular plantation, young plantation. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of option on short placement. The only option I really had there was neck shot, which is normally the cleanest shot. Animal drops clean. And it did. And he did. You've got an enormous variety of ground here. You've got a bit of hill, you've got shoreline, you've got, you've got all sorts, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, good mixture of everything, yeah. Um, which helps depending on the weather. If the weather's not suiting to be out in the hill, usually you can find something in the, in the mature trees or in the, the young stuff. And a plantation like the one that's, you, you can't see it, but it's behind these trees here. Is that what you call a bag filler? I mean, would you, is, it, is this where you come when you... When yeah, you... yeah, pretty much a banker, yeah. Um, you know, there's always got to be something about in a place like this, yeah. And indeed there was. Yeah. 
Colin charges £70 per Roebuck outing, plus shot fee and trophy fee. You can take days off him and he runs an eight-strong syndicate for deer, boar, grouse on the hill and Solway duck and geese. Email solwaystalker at aol.co.uk We love our deer at Field Sports Channel. Look, there's one in the sky right now. If you click on it, you can see more of our deer stalking films. Now it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. We start with Channel 4's Foxes Live programme, which came out on British television this week. The TV station filmed urban foxes showing how cuddly they are and tracked them with GPS collars up and down the country. This, of course, makes locating and possibly shooting Patch, Grace, Chico, Ringtail, Basil, Diesel or Rathbone very easy. One of the shooting forums has already suggested this, then putting the collars on eBay. We rang Channel 4's production company saying this would certainly spice things up a bit. They asked us not to shoot the foxes until after they've collected the GPS data, which will be after the 13th of May 2012. They're giving guns to kids in Gloucestershire again this weekend. The school's challenge and festival of shooting at Breeden School are both on this weekend at Breeden School near Tewkesbury. There are plenty of shooting sports for you to enjoy and a prize pot worth £6,000 in the open clay competition on Monday. Visit theschoolschallenge.co.uk Rugby player Scott Armstrong has shot a gold medal buck, provisionally measured at 70 points. That's a few more points than he scored for Northampton Saints in the last couple of seasons where he plays winger. He was out with new stalking guide, Muntjack Stalker. Visit muntjackstalker.com. Now for a piece of road rage in South Africa. This contestant for Team Jeep South Africa was riding hard when he was hit by a red hearty beast. Let's just watch that again. He ends up with a very stiff neck. And finally, we've been sent some exclusive footage of cockfighting, first made illegal in England and Wales in 1835. This fierce battle was at a barn in Surrey. Thankfully, neither of the cock sparrows was killed and were later seen courting and making nests within minutes of the fight being broken up. No one was arrested. You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Still sticking out like a sore thumb. Now, we all know that there's no camouflage like real tree camouflage, and this week, Team Wild TV is wrapping their trucks in the very best patterns that Realtree has to offer. Click on the angry buck that's appeared in the sky up there, and you can watch that film. We're staying in Scotland and finding out why it's such a popular destination for shooters in April. Scotland is where the world wants to be in April and May. The combination of great roebuck stalking and superb pigeon mean shooters will travel thousands of miles, put up with the often amusing food and brave the uncertain weather for a chance at these two prized quarry. Alan, what does it take to put together a three-day trip like this for a party of how many? Is it six of them? Six guns, yes. Uh... Start by uh, doing a lot of uh, reconnaissance work before they arrive. Uh, look where the deer are. These, obviously these guys are in for three days, six stalks. So we spent like three days looking for the deer. And the pigeon shooting here, do they, do they have this kind of thing in France? They must do. Very little, very little. They only have uh, a two week window of migration for pigeons. And then after that they have nothing. Really? So they're, so they're, they're, they're basically stuck and they, they've got to come here? They've they? got to come here, yes. Or hungry, which is 25 times as expensive. Correct, yes. <laughs> so you're, you're in a good place here? We're in a good place, yes, and we try to provide uh, very good shooting for them. We are in Perthshire with a party of French from the retail giant Decathlon. They have asked some French journalists to try out Scottish pigeons, stalking and Decathlon kit. You may have seen decathlon shops outside Reading, Birmingham, Belfast, Glasgow and other places and you may have dismissed it for being full of overpriced golf clubs. Not a bit of it. Decathlon has its own hunting clothing and accessories brand called Solignac and, if anything, its kit is underpriced.
Forget about the width, however, and feel the quality. Solignac needs to be good if it's going to face pigeon shooting in weather like this. Solignac is Decathlon's own brand hunting brand. And Decathlon is a sports shop? Decathlon is, it's a very well kept secret over here in the UK, but Decathlon is the world's biggest sports retailer. And there are several of them here in the UK? There are 12 or 13 here in the UK, yeah, all over from London to Edinburgh to Glasgow to Belfast. And, and they're big, aren't they? That's, that's they're, quite a they're, they're big. They're anywhere from 3,000 square metres to 6,000 square metres in the UK, and on the continent go up to 10,000 square metres. So that's like a Tesco, basically? Uh, yes, it's the Tesco of sport. Right. We, might, we might use that. <laughs> and you sell hunting gear, which is kind of unusual for a sports shop. It is unusual for an English sports shop, um, but it's very normal for a continental sports shop and it's very normal particularly for a French sports shop, which is where we come from originally. And you don't have Decathlon written on your hat, you've got Solignac. What's, how does that work? That's absolutely right. Well, each of Decathlon's brands are separated out um, and given their own identity and their own name. Uh, Solignac actually comes from a combination of La Sologne, which is the biggest hunting region in France, and uh, the Bordeaux area, where every single village seems to end in AC, so AC, um, which is now the biggest, uh, has the highest population of hunters. We're here in Scotland. In terms of Europe, what does Scotland mean? What to, to European hunters? Uh, Scotland means deer stalking, it means hunting, it means everything that we know. Scotland, you know, everything we know about Scotland, everything we think about Scotland, the Europeans share that. Uh, Share that view. So the French consider Scotland to be a really great place to come for pigeons. The for French radio. consider Scotland a fantastic place to come. We're here testing equipment. There was only one name in Europe to come and test this sort of stuff, and that was Scotland. Everybody wanted to be here. The weather might be foul, but the pigeon shooting is excellent and tests the guns to their limits. Birds that normally go past at around 55 miles an hour are breaking the national speed limit in this wind. It's fun. <laughs> fun but cold. We are also here to stalk roe deer. All of us get either high seats or accompaniment. I go out with a local stalker, Sean. He shows me lots of animals. We see around 20 in the morning, but either they are does or in the wrong place or retreating. Finally, we find a cull buck in the right place and I start my stalk in. It's all going so well. The buck is just over the brow. It hasn't seen me, nor the camera. But then, disaster strikes, and it's off. So, no roebuck for me, but the French have a good time. We are in Perthshire with sporting agent Service UK. Visit www.service-uk.co.uk And for more about the kit from Solignac, go to www.solignac-hunting.com Now, lamping foxes is fraught with danger, and not just for the fox. Here's how to improve your technique. One of the reasons people love fox shooting is it can be so challenging. There are so many factors to be taken into consideration, especially at night. Your decision-making process has to be fast and safe. Today we are going to conduct a little experiment to see how shooters can improve their fox shooting technique. We have Tom, the novice, who has very little rifle experience and has never shot a fox. And we have Roy, who has accounted for quite a few. Tim Pillbeam, rifle reviewer for Sporting Rifle magazine, is in charge. He's come up with a cunning plan to challenge the young apprentice and tax the old hand. So tonight it's all about the ABCs of fox shooting. We're shooting different foxes, different ranges, in different situations. So it's safety, range, decision making and dealing with the, the light. So what do you think the range is going to be on that one? So especially for Roy, I'll be asking many questions. How far is it Roy? How safe is it Roy? And also with Tom, I'll, we'll be able to be guiding him to make sure that he actually does shoot the fox in a very, very safe and correct method. This is a typical target we're shooting at tonight, a bit of plywood. I paint it black and we've got a very, very typical sized fox here. Uh, four inches by ten inches is the normal kill zone of a fox. Um, so this is what we'll be practicing tonight. I've got a couple of um, bicycle reflectors there to, to show his eyes. And for a bit of fun tonight is we're going to see if we can get these guys to start shooting uh, these exploding targets and that'd be quite exciting to see at night time. Tim right. drives us around the course in daylight to get the lay of the land and to talk us through a few of the targets. This is a typical foxing situation. 
We've got two foxes here, one in the alleyway and one next to the telegraph pole. One in the alleyway is about 120 yards away, the one near the telegraph pole is about 170 yards away. Both really straightforward shots, but we need to get a decent position to shoot them. Do we use a tree? Do we actually put the bipod on the, on the bonnet here? Or do we lay down in the grass and use the, the bipod in a prone position? For the last of the targets of the evening, he is giving the guys something a bit more tricky. The ones we've got in front of me at the moment, they're about 220 yards away. But the problem is, is they are they're head on, they're front on, these foxes, quite narrow. The kill zone of a fox when it's sitting down in front of you is about six inches wide. So they've got to make sure they get that shot bang on. I'd say it's 220 yards away, so really they should be aiming right at, at, the, at the kill zone. And it doesn't stop there. Tim is really going to try and simulate the unpredictability of the quarry and possibly the erratic yeah, technique of the lamp man. What I will be doing is flashing the spotlight around. Sometimes I'll be taking it off the fox, sometimes I'll be putting it on the fox, and just before they shoot, I'll take it off the fox. And that's what happens in fox shooting. Also, sometimes if you flash light around, around you, your eyes get um, blinded. So, so the light's very, very important. Also, I'll be sometimes putting the light on the fox and then say one, two, three, and take it off. Very often the foxes, they don't stand that long. They stand for about five or ten seconds and then they move on again. So it's very important to get uh, uh, the crosshairs on the fox, make a decision and shoot it. Some targets will appear as we climb over the brow of a hill and others will offer some more choice to get into a stable position. Bonnet, post or prone for this one. We've got to decide here what we While we have been scooting off. around this simulated foxing course on Tim's farm and uh, practice range, Roy has been giving Tom again. some tuition. He spots yeah. something which, if caught early, can be easily remedied. Right. You are, when you're shooting, yeah. you're, you're expecting the, the shot, yeah? So when you shot there, you went like that, so you're, you're actually twitching slightly okay. so you if you when you're watching when you're watching your eye your eye blinked okay and it should okay. you should just you should stay in contact with the target at all times so when you squeeze okay just try just concentrate on looking straight through and look at care and concentrate on the target so right. when the round goes off when the shot goes off yeah. then you should still see the target and you should still see the, the shot hit okay, okay? so yeah. what you did what you did then you you blinked and you, you just twitched slightly okay. Tim also gives Tom some tips and finds out just how much experience he has. So, so Tom, tell me about your first deer you shot. The first deer was up in Scotland. We went up to an estate just uh, 45 miles above Inverness in the hill. Um, it was a red hind, uh -huh. um, which was shot a uh, distance of about 150 yards. Um, that was the 30 6 OK, brilliant. Uh, yeah. And tell me more about your rifle. Um, this is a 708 Remington rifle with a... Um, quite a heavy barrel on it, and obviously quite a heavy mod rater as well. Mm. Um, so it's a it's very so this is an all-round um, rifle. It was shoot, obviously you can shoot deer with it, you can shoot foxes with it. Uh, so it's a very capable round. It's in 708, which is a, a very good all-round caliber. Yeah. Um, so the idea was it, it sort of fits everything. You can shoot everything from foxes up to deer and anything I'd want to shoot from here really. Before we lose the light and the fun begins, Roy and Tom have a few more shots. Both are now happy with their setup, but there's still plenty to go through. From having one up the spout, and I think in the in the vehicle, bolts open basically. Yeah, simple as that. I think really. To the magnification you're happy with, to spotting these cunning foxes. Right, we're off, and they just can't help themselves. Roy starts blowing, and foxes, three real ones that is, come hunting. Tom is told to get into position. Already there are errors and we lose two of the interested foxes. With our remaining fox at 250 yards, Tim takes over, shooting from the buggy frame. The shot sounds good. It's all gone. What happened to a simulated night? <laughs> That's actually very interesting because Roy, Roy the boy got his wonderful squeaker out and immediately we pulled, we actually pulled it one to us to our north here, one down the bottom here, down the bottom of the farm, and also we had one down just down over here as well. So we had three contenders. Now, first of all, we stopped, and we stopped in the wrong place, unfortunately, my fault, and we couldn't actually get onto them at all. So we moved the, the, the buggy over here, 
and Roy kept on squeaking and uh, we actually found a real one, which is quite exciting. So that's probably what, 250 yards, I think, wasn't it, Roy? Yeah, 250. 250 yards. What was interesting as well, actually, is earlier on, we had a couple of uh, eyes over the back here, which looked very, very similar to that of a fox. But there's one slight problem, is the eyes were on top of the hedge. So I don't think it was actually a fox, but uh, it just shows you how careful you've got to be. And you must know your land. And I knew exactly that was on top of the hedge, so there's no way I can shoot that. But uh, you had to be very careful at night. But a good start, guys. Well done. Excellent bullet goes straight through the shoulder and out the other side. Yeah, nice looking animal actually, it's quite a small fox. But uh, best fox is dead fox, as far as I can say. So points to remember here are don't step in front of the lamb, don't choose an unstable rest, Tom picked a duff post to lean on, and of course don't make too much noise, which everyone is guilty of. I mean, that was an absolutely perfect example of what not to do when you're out foxing. We had people sort of, you know, fumbling about all over the place, lights going all over the place. Um, and as a consequence, it cost us the foxes. We had one fox coming right into us. Um, and just because we weren't sure and there was a bit of fumbling and a bit of noise, the fox came in, made us and, and was off again. Right back to the simulated animals. So, These are the ones over the brow. Tom shoots off the frame. Roy goes for the bipod on the bonnet. Both the guys have hit the kill zone, but one of Tom's shots has pulled shot. to the right. Next shot. up are the pair of foxes near the post. Tim gives them ten seconds to shoot. There are firebirds on these targets. Roy, the spoil sport, nabs both his and Tom's. Naughty. Well, there's three shots here, which tells me that some person's been shooting the wrong target, Lupton. <laughs> The shots are still good, even if greedy Lupton has taken both foxes. So what does Tom think so far? First time I've actually shot at a target prone in the dark, so mm. the whole thing was a sort of new experience, really. Yeah. But so how do you find the light? Because the light was, I, oh, the light was kind of moving a wee bit. Yeah, that didn't bother me too much. I was just trying to get my um, my crosshairs in the middle of the two um, cat's eyes looking at me, yeah, or yeah. fox eyes in this case. Um, so the, the light didn't wasn't too distracting at all, really. Yeah. It was just, yeah, I think a lot of people think the foxing they, is easy, but there's actually an awful lot to consider. I thought that was a lot harder actually. I've always thought the idea of lamping is you, you see the fox under the lamp, and you, but you, it's completely different, you don't. You see the no. two little spots looking at you. Yeah. 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 The next two targets are the one in the track and its neighbour. Range is an issue here, and the shooting sticks also cause problems. Last but one are the targets we first looked at in daylight. Tom has a real problem here, but Roy is in his comfort zone and the little tinker even shoots one of Tim's reflectors. You yeah, haven't shot one of my eyes. <laughs> Last up are the head-on foxes. Tom is again struggling. It's getting late and we're all tired. Tim takes over and sees the last firebird go bang. So what do the chaps think of the evening? And what's your advice to anybody wanting to go fox shooting for the first time? At night, yeah. get a warm jacket. <laughs> <laughs> um, be calm and have confidence, I think. Yeah. And practice, yeah. practice, practice. Plenty yeah. of practice. Yeah. And I mean, is, it, is it how you thought it would be? Yeah, better actually. Yeah. I must admit, first of all, I thought you'd see the big fox coming and it'd be nice and easy, a bit like, I suppose, you're deer stalking, but this is it's completely different. It's, you don't see the animal and um, it's, you just... Like I say, I think you do have to have confidence in where you're shooting and you will hit the target. Tim has been keeping a score of how the guys have performed. Roy has shot well but has been a bit fruity with not keeping to his own target. There's got, we got Roy here who's, who tends to shoot anything in front of him. He shot two eyes out of my foxes, he shot somebody else's target so Roy's very, very greedy. And we've got the youngster as well who has shot very, very well. So tonight I think that the uh, the winner is going to be the youngster Tom. So well done, Tom. You thank shot you very really much. well. Thank you very much. Well done, mate. Well shot. Cheers. Thank you. Well done. Super. Oh, it's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> Films about fox shooting is one of our specialities. There's a fox now. If you click on it, you can watch some of them. Next, it's our weekly YouTube roundup.
Icelandic viewer Nesvaga1 has sent us his handheld mink hunting video from the land of Vikings, volcanoes and now vermin. It's in a funny foreign language but it has top action shots of dogs hunting Ivana Trump's favourite pest. Talking of vermin, viewers have complained that we were unwarrantably rude about Hunter's Vermin's video for Airgun TV in last week's episode. We love Hunter's Vermin and to prove it here is his excellent latest air rifle hunting farmyard vermin control. The people behind Spotting Rifle magazine, Blaze Publishing, have brought out their own video magazine show, The Shooting Show. It has items about going shooting, it has an annoying presenter and a slightly weird newsreader. Now why didn't we think of that? Online Fishing TV has brought out its fly fishing news film. It's a video bulletin of the latest goings on in the world of fly fishing in the UK and overseas. Lionsgate Films has put up some clips and this behind the scenes look at the film of the new fly fishing epic, Salmon Fishing in the Yemen. Far too much romance and not enough fishing. Here, it's very cold. It rains a lot. Mm. Here, it's very hot. It doesn't rain a lot. Do you see the difference? Well, you're pointing to Saudi Arabia, Dr. Jones, not the Yemen. Yorkshire Rose Stalking has a dramatic new film called Misfire Nearly Costs Us a Buck. Clue is in the title, but you have to feel for the shooter when both you and the deer hear the rifle go click. Luckily, he reloads quietly enough not to spook the animal. Greg Login Way has produced a short series called How to Boil Out Deer Head. This is from part three, which is about bleaching a non-metal trophy head. It's not going to win an award for cinematography, but handy if you want to know how. Oops, there we go, being rude again. And finally, viewer Philip140, a Brit who lives in Canada, has sent us a film about how to make your own shoot and see targets with nothing but some white laminated paper and black spray paint. You can click on any of these films to watch them. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel. TV. Well, we're back next week, and if you're watching this on YouTube, don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button that's somewhere on the edge of the screen, they keep moving it around. Or we are, of course, a YouTube show. You can go to www.youtube.com slash show slash Britain and subscribe there. Or go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, scroll down to the bottom, there is a box there. You pop your email address into there and we spam you with news of our programme every week. Similarly, on Facebook and on Twitter, same place. This has been Fieldsports Britain. Out here, on the hill, in the sun, suffering, trying not to look smug for you. <laughs>